So this is an update lecture on the Birmingham knee replacement and my goal in this talk is to try and explain what the Birmingham knee is all about, the design rationale for it and why we need another knee replacement. There would not be a reason to design another knee replacement if we were merely assessing how well standard knee replacements last because standard knee replacements last well and there's a number of series with 95% or better uh, implant survivorship at 10 years. The problem with knee replacement is not how long they last. The problem is how well does it work and patients are not universally happy after their knee replacement and this lady is typical asking why is it so tight at the front of my knee. Indeed we know that nearly 20% of patients are less than thrilled with the outcome of their knee replacement. There's also new information from the National Joint Register PROMS data. PROMS is patient reported outcome measures and Patients were asked, are their problems much better since operation? And interestingly, total hip replacement only scored 85.6%. And that's, that surprises me. Uh, I thought total hip replacement would show a much better figure of patients much better since their total hip replacement. However, that's the number. That compares to our first 1,000 Birmingham hip resurfacings with... 12 to 15 year follow-up and 99.7 percent of those patients were either extremely satisfied or satisfied but on the knees on the proms data from the national joint register they are shockingly bad and only 70.8 percent of patients were much better since their total knee replacement and that just shows nearly 30 percent of patients that we've got to improve on for with knee replacement. The debate for many years has been should we resurface the patella in a total knee replacement? How can we get perfect patella tracking? Should we lateralize and externally rotate the femoral component? Should we medialize the patella button? And then you arrive at work in an outpatient clinic and the first patient's skyline x-ray shows bilateral patella maltracking and you think why in the world did I come to work today but Merrill Ritter from Mooresville in the United States has produced very important information on this and he's looked at a huge series of knee replacements and separated the patients into those with in quotes normal patella tracking and those with lateral patella maltracking and what he found was that the patients with lateral patella maltracking have better knee function than those with normal tracking. That was quite an extraordinary revelation. And I think it is one of the most important observations in knee surgery. And I will try and make sense of that for you in this talk. If we just feel our normal knees at 90 degrees of flexion the patella is a lateral structure you can see in this little drawing that the lateral aspect of the patella is in line with the edge of the lateral femoral condyle but about two-thirds of the surface of the medial femoral condyle is uncovered by the patella when the knee is flexed so the patella is a lateral structure when the knee is flexed. And then we go and do a standard replacement. And the area that the patella can occupy in flexion is the gap between the condyles. And it's right in the middle of the knee. So we are forcing the patella to move from its normal lateral location into the center of the knee. That's what a regular knee replacement 
does for patella tracking. And I've had a little patella tracker for nearly 20 years now, and I've checked the tracking on many different designs of knee replacement. And this is a two-part structure where there's two flimsy pieces of metal, and they're allowed to slide on each other from side to side. The metal blaze plate has uh, pins which uh, fix onto the cut surface of the patella and the plastic button follows the femoral component. And then with the knee inflection you can observe where the patella actually is and you can also observe where the patella wants to be. And I found to my horror that regularly there's 10 millimeters of patella maltracking and no amount of lateral displacement of the femoral component on the bone or external rotation of the femoral component or lateral retinacular release would cure this 10 millimeter problem and I was left with the conclusion after doing this little tracking exercise for years that lateral patella maltracking was inevitable when you do a regular knee replacement. The next very important observation was from Professor Kratovitz in Hungary and he measured the surfaces of the normal femur and he has even defined the mathematical equations and the condyles of the femur may not look it because your eye follows the cutout of the periphery of the femoral component but what he found was that these condyles are spiral and that's a very important observation now what might a spiral do well if you just look at the situation with a bolt in a nut as you turn the bolt there is a, a translation of the bolt within the nut and if the condyles of the knee are spiral there may well be a side to side translatory effect but is this reality? Well, this piece of work from the Rizzoli Institute in Bologna has now been published, and I urge you to read this because they have looked in detail and published the translatory movements that occur with flexion of the knee. They have excellent trackers in their motion laboratory and they can track the position of the femur, the tibia, and the patella. Here is the experimental setup on cadaver legs, and the quadriceps muscles are loaded, and the knee is passively flexed, and then the trackers document the position of the tibia, the femur, and the patella. This diagram is from their publication, and on 22 cadaver knees, what this shows is that when the femur flexes on the tibia, then there is a translatory movement. And as the femur flexes, the femur laterally translates across the surface of the tibia. And on average, there's around 5 millimeters of lateral translation occurring as the knee flexes. Now this is a new motion pattern of the knee and it's a very important one. Can a spiral condyle knee design mimic the function of the natural spiral condyles? You need to understand that there's both a dynamic effect and a static effect. And the dynamic effect is the bolt turning in the nut with a translatory movement and the static effect is purely an effect of the pitch of the spiral because the patella is roughly 90 degrees round the corner from the tibiofemoral articulation. The greater the pitch of the spiral condyle, 
the more lateral displacement of the patella occurs. I'm going to show you now the dynamic effect. So this is the Birmingham knee being flexed and extended and you can see on the lateral side there as it's flexed the femur translates laterally of the tibia and the reverse occurs when it's extended. So that accounts for the dynamic effect but there's also a static effect and the static effect is to do with how much pitch there is on the femoral condyles and there's an exaggerated pitch on these condyles for the purposes of illustration and you can see that thanks to the pitch of the spiral on the condyles the patella is displaced laterally compared to the midpoint of the tibia and what you need to arrange and what we have arranged in the Birmingham knee is that there's five millimeters of lateral movement of the femur on the tibia when it flexes due to a dynamic effect and there's also five millimeters of lateral displacement of the patella purely as a result of the pitch of the spiral. Add the two fives together and that accounts for the 10 millimeters of maltracking that I observed routinely on standard knee replacements. Here we're back at the uh, Rizzoli uh, Institute again with trackers on the femur, tibia and patella and now we're interested in the position of the patella when the knee is flexed and extended. And in simple terms, the patella in extension is more or less in the midline. But when the knee is flexed, then the patella moves to a lateral position. And this is no surprise to us at all because we can confirm this simply by feeling our own patella and understanding that it's a lateral structure in flexion. Now this is what happens when you take the same cadaveric femur and put a standard total knee replacement on it. I don't wish to mention the standard knee replacements type. In fact, we did two different knee replacements from two very large companies and both produced very similar results. And what happens here is when you put a knee replacement in of a standard regular type, the patella in flexion moves to the midline. Now we know that already because the patella is moving into the gap between the two femoral condyles when the knee is flexed. And you can see now that there's a one centimeter difference between where the patella starts off, the red line at the bottom in flexion, and where the patella ends up when you put a standard knee replacement in. And that again is the one centimeter problem. Patients don't like their patella being abnormally dragged one centimeter to medial. And patients after knee replacement report that it hurts. We can confirm that it hurts. If you try and move your patella from its normal lateral position to one centimeter medial to that, so try and move your patella from its normal lateral position to the midline, and you'll find that you can't do it. The retinacular structures do not wish to let the patella move one centimeter towards the midline. Now, onto the same cuts on the same cadaver knee, what we've done is put on a modified Birmingham knee replacement that will fit those previous cuts. And it changes the position that the patella occupies completely. Now, when the knee is flexed, the black line, the patella in flexion is in its normal lateral location. This is consistent with a good outcome following knee replacement and a happy patient. This is the tracker that we now use at a Birmingham knee replacement and it's very similar to the old tracker. There is a metal base plate and a plastic articulating component and a tube coming out and you can read off the amount of patella maltracking that you've got. 
and inflection, you want there to be zero maltracking. In most cases, simply putting in the Birmingham knee spiral condyle design puts the patella in the right place but you can fine tune the position because we have three millimeter, five millimeter and seven millimeter offset patella domes. So you can get the tracking absolutely spot on and we do. Here we are during surgery. We've got the trial tibial and trial femoral components in and we're now preparing the patella to have its preparation. There's the cutting device on and we're cutting off the articular surface of the patella of the same thickness as the replacement patella button that will go on. Here we're putting on our temporary tracker. There's the base plate being pushed into the cut surface of the patella bone. And we're just squeezing it all on so that it's a tight fit during the tracking procedure. You can see that the plastic part moves side to side on the metal base plate. The plastic part will follow the patella track in the trial femoral component. We stitched up the medial retinaculum and um, that will allow normal soft tissue tension and then we flex and extend the knee and observe the tracking of the patella and we want that to be zero. If it's not zero we have options to get the patella tracking absolutely spot on. We can adjust the position of the femoral trial on the femur. We can adjust the position of the patella on the bone or we can more easily select either a three, five or a seven millimeter offset patella button. Once we've got our position correct we drill the holes in the patella now the definitive tibial base plate and the femoral component have uh, been inserted and we're now putting on the selected uh, offset patella button. just trimming off cement and finishing off our patella cementation. I just want to show you a patient where I did a Birmingham knee replacement but I did not resurface the patella and in the past I used to do this quite a lot if the patella articular surface looked in good shape then I didn't resurface it. If the patella articular surface was worn then I resurfaced the patella. But I found out with time that this is not a good idea with a Birmingham knee replacement because these people get back so much function in their knees that they wear out their patella articular surface. There's the pre-op skyline and the patella articular surface look good. There's the knee replacement post-op x-ray. There's the skyline. Everything looks okay. But two years later, the patella articular surface has worn out. The patient got pain and was unhappy and I had to resurface his patella the pain disappeared and good function returned. So here's the Knee Society scores 
um, at one year, the score was 100, but by two years, when the patella had started to wear out, then the score dropped to 90, and he was unhappy. Then I resurfaced his patella, and a year and a half following that, his score was back at 100, and he was happy. So always now, I resurface the patella when I do a Birmingham knee replacement because the high function uh, will wear out the articular cartilage of the patella. So this is an IB2 knee, very commonly used device in the past, and you can see that in mid-flexion there is tremendous back-to-front skid and that back to front skid is common in a lot of knee replacement designs now. Of course, when the peg and cam engage at higher flexion, then there is no such back to front skid. However, that back to front skidding is not great for wear of the tibial component, and it's bad for the patella because as the femur skids forward, you get high contact stresses and it can give anterior knee pain. The second problem with standard posterior stabilized knees is as the knee flexes the cam rides up the peg and that is not good news for wear of the peg. It's also bad because with increasing flexion then the peg and cam can disengage. Now we've solved that with the Birmingham knee on the front to back stability, this is a ball and socket, and so the knee is stable front to back. So you don't get that abnormal skidding forwards of the femur in flexion. The second thing we've solved is by redesigning the cam peg mechanism into this patented design, then that cam does not ride up the peg. And that's good for stability and it's good for wear. So this ball and socket design, which extends from 0 to 80 degrees of flexion, gives front-to-back stability, and that stops the abnormal back-to-front skid as the knee flexes. The ball and socket design is also good for wear, and the Birmingham knee has been tested in Stanmore on the Stanmore Knee Simulator to 5 million cycles and you can see here the various knee replacement designs averaged out that have been tested in Stanmore and you can see the amount of wear from the Birmingham knee replacement at 5 million cycles and the ball and socket design gives much lower wear than other mobile bearing knee replacements. I want to uh, consider the knee in full flexion now and a very good paper on this is in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery by Pince Karova. This is an MRI scan of the lateral compartment of the knee in full flexion and you can see that the femur has rolled back right to the posterior edge of the tibia. On the medial side, there is also rollback of the femur on the tibia in full flexion. Now, an interesting aspect that you can see very well on that MRI scan is the particular shape of the condylar surface of the femur. And it's traditionally described as a J-shaped femoral shape. The radius on the extension part of the knee is much bigger than the radius on the flexion aspect of the knee. And folks have drawn circles around the extension radius and the flexion radius. And you can see that the extension radius is much bigger than the flexion radius. And this is of importance in the normal knee, obviously but it's also of importance in the replaced knee. From that paper, the top line shows the amount of posterior displacement of the femur that occurs on the tibia, and from uh, 20 to 110 degrees, the femur stays 
in the same place on the tibia but from 110 degrees to 160 degrees there is posterior displacement of the femur on the tibia on this medial side. The movement of the femur on the tibia on the lateral side, the lower graph, is, is quite different and here as the knee flexes the femur gradually moves back on the tibia to a very extreme position in full flexion. Now that's a photo of the Birmingham knee replacement in mid-flexion and at high flexion. And the Birmingham knee replacement is a J-shaped femur. And there's one circle around the uh, extension area and a much tighter uh, radius circle around the uh, flexion area. And the cam peg mechanism induces that femur to move to the back of the tibia with high knee flexion. Now this is a completely different knee replacement. This is one of the medial pivoting knees and here the medial side is a ball and socket joint and on the lateral side the simulation shows what is hoped to happen namely that on increasing flexion the femur moves to the back of the tibial component. But that ball and socket on the medial side gives good front-to-back stability. So that is a design advantage. But the difference between that knee, uh, or that class of knees, and the Birmingham knee is that that is a single radius, whereas the Birmingham knee replacement has two radii. Big radius for the extension uh, area of the femur, and a much smaller radius for the flexion aspect of the femur. Now this is yet another type of medial pivoting knee and in extension everything looks fine, in mid flexion everything looks fine, but the right hand photograph of high flexion shows the disadvantage of a single radius design. As that knee is flexed up into high flexion, you can see that the posterior aspect of the condyles moves tremendously forward on the tibia. And of course that knee is very unlikely to ever get to that amount of flexion in a patient because the femur, uh, the back of the femur, would impinge on the back of the tibial component and prevent such high flexion. So there's the downside of a single radius. Good for front to back stability, but not good at all in high flexion because of this very abnormal forward movement of the femur on the tibia. There's the Birmingham knee in high flexion and it moves to that position because of the cam peg mechanism. And the picture on the left shows the area uh, of contact on the tibial component and this is a big area of contact and this is the so-called third condyle so that is good for wear. Here's a patient having had a uh, right-sided Birmingham knee replacement and she's six weeks after the surgery and you can see she's got really good flexion of her right knee. There's a close-up showing the scar of the uh, right BKR and uh, the amount of flexion that she's got on this right knee equals her normal left knee. Now I'm going to show you a series of patients that I've replaced with the Birmingham knee and this is 82 knees in 75 patients. And 79 of those knees have a minimum of uh, one year follow-up. Now, here in red is that current series of one to six year follow-up of the Birmingham knees. And you can see that their knee society function scores are very comparable to other series of knee replacements that have been published. So there's nothing strange there. The clinical assessment part of the Knee Society score, again, very comparable scores to other knee replacements. Now, what we know is that the Oxford Medial Unicompartmental Knee provides extremely good results. 
And this, in my series, gives uh, results as close to the normal knee as I think you can possibly get. So on the left is a medial Oxford knee that I've done, and on the right is a standard total knee replacement, which I've done. Now, the standard total knee replacement results are nowhere near as good as, an, as a medial compartmental knee. The Oxford medial compartmental knee results have been published by Pandit and others, and you can see there on the left the preoperative Oxford scores and the follow-up Oxford scores in those Oxford uni knees, and those are good results. On the right are the Oxford scores pre-op and at follow-up, a minimum one year, uh, of the Birmingham knees, and they look pretty good. However, those uh, BKR follow-up results include 10 patients whose scores or inferior scores were due to other pathologies. That is to say, there were 10 patients who had, for example, arthritis and disability of their opposite knee or arthritis and disability of one of their hips. When those 10 patients are excluded, then what do you know? The Oxford scores are even better. In fact, the mean Oxford score is 12, and 12 is the best Oxford score you can get. So these Birmingham knee replacements look very special in terms of function scores. Now, even more impressive is the range of movement which is shown for the BKRs in red. And what we know from the past is that the range of movement that you get on follow-up following a standard total knee replacement is roughly the same as you have prior to your knee being replaced. However, quite a different story with the BKR. Here, the post-operative range of movement is much better. 21 degrees improvement in the range of uh, flexion compared to the preoperative range of movement. So we're very excited about that and we feel that putting the patella in the right place after the BKR and not exerting abnormal tension on all the tissues around the kneecap obviates pain and allows people to flex their knee further. Now we're trying to get some objective testing on the BKR and we've started this with Dr. Victoria Manning and Professor Justin Cobb at the Musculoskeletal Lab at Imperial College London and they have developed a, uh, a walkway test and uh, this is very interesting for uh, knee replacements. And the first five BKR patients have traveled down to London and Dr. Manning has uh, carried out their walkway assessment on these patients. And the idea is you go on the walkway and gradually they speed this up until you are walking as fast as you possibly can. And the uh, force plates assess how much load you're putting through each leg. Now here's a typical printout that you get from Dr. Manning's work and this is a double peak line and the first peak is on heel strike and then it dips as you transfer through the stance phase of gait and then there's a second peak on toe off and the blue line is the normal untouched side in this patient and the red line is the knee that's had the BKR and that shows the force per body weight that goes through both the left leg and the right leg and these are very comparable graphs of the BKR side versus the normal knee and this is very exciting because this really is objective testing and the only knee replacement that regularly produces graphs like this, I'm told, is indeed a medial unicompartmental replacement. So now we're getting some beginnings of objective testing 
which is showing that the BKR is functioning quite well. And this man's uh, maximum walking speed was 11 kilometers per hour. Just for comparison, this is a patient similar age and BMI, and his maximum walking speed was only six and a half kilometers per hour. But the graphs of both knees are quite different to the one I just showed you of a BKR patient. So you can see on the second peak particularly, the replace side nor near matches the load going through that side compared to his opposite unreplaced knee. And why do you not put the same loading through the replaced knee as your normal knee? Well, it may be due to pain, and I've shown you already why patients might well have pain following a regular knee replacement. Or it may be due to instability. So if you have that abnormal front to back skid of your knee, then you may not feel secure to get up to a very fast walking speed. But it's very early days and only five Birmingham knee patients have been tested. So we're going to make yet another appeal to our BKR patients to please travel down to London by train and uh, have your assessment done by Dr. Manning. And then we'll get a big series that will be able to be properly scientifically compared to standard issue knee replacement patients. So the Birmingham knee with its spiral condyles allows normal lateral translation of the femur on the tibia and it allows normal patella tracking. And that means that there is no abnormal retinacular tension and it is comfortable for patients to achieve a good range of knee flexion. There are a number of design features that I could go into, but in particular, you need to understand that this knee is specifically designed so that there is front to back stability and there is no abnormal back to front skid of the femur on the tibia. It has a J-shaped uh, femoral condyle and the cam peg mechanism allows high flexion of the knee with the femur right at the back of the tibia. And that, of course, is good for getting high flexion and keeping down the patellofemoral contact stresses and anterior knee discomfort. I hope that that explains what the BKR is all about. And I thank you for listening.